Well, welcome to Hanukkah. Welcome to the enigma that is the mystery behind the veil of Hanukkah. The biggest mystery being how the heck you spell it. Eh. What? Well, there you go. Um, Chanukah. Glasses. Put your glasses on, Arnie. That'll help. You might think I've got a modicum of intelligence then. Uh, don't don't you think we're getting to a place where your faith might actually start meaning something? And if you're a real deal believer, I, I can assure you that faith will be put to the test. It will. You're not going to be afforded the opportunity to sit on the fence if you are a real dealer. If you're a real dealer, you won't anyway, will you? You won't going to, and it is getting real. You're going to have to read the word. You're going to have to choose what side you're on. It's getting there. We, uh, we're, we're at a time I've never known the the CCP is an existential threat to Christianity worldwide. Um, that being said, they've been controlling China since 1949. Not wiped Christianity out, have they? If anything, the fans of the winds of persecution have fanned the flames and made it all the more come out, haven't they? The truth. Because that's what does it. The more, the more you persecute Christianity, the bigger it's going to get. And you've got to beware of who you are. Look, th this is a quote. This is a t-shirt Beth made me because evil's powerful, powerless if the good are unafraid. It was a quote by Ronald Reagan. And it's very, very true. Where's your fear? How big's your God? You know when when Yeshua went to Caesarea Philippi up in Mount Hermon, it was known to be a satanic place. The boys were af afraid to go. There's a there's a cave there, the Cave of Pan. If you go on tour, you'll see it. The Cave of Pan. It was satanic. There was Satanic ritual abuse there. Evil place. And it was known as the gates of hell. And Yeshua took the boys there for a reason. And it was there that he said, Who do you think I am? Who are people saying I am? And Peter said, Shimon Kepha, You're the Messiah. Yeah? Peter, you didn't get that from yourself. That came from the Father. Yeah? And the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, understand, when something's got a gate, what is it? That's a defense. It's a defense. Gates are a defense. Meaning, the faith's going to attack those gates. They're not coming after us. We're going after them. Know, know which side you're on and be fearless. Fear has got no power when you've got no fear. We're attacking the gates of hell. If I've got 12 people in here who are prepared to do that with water pistols, we're on a winner. That's who I'm looking for. We can change, the, we can change Perth with 12 people who are, who are that fearless. Understand, that's what Hanukkah's about. That's your message right there. You might as well all go on, because that's your message right there. They think they're bringing the fight to us. We're taking it to them. 
You've got to align yourself with Yeshua's walk and follow it the best way you can. Fair? He has new mercies, new grace every day. We've got to be obedient to the word. What would Jesus do? You don't need a wristband. Just do what he did. Simple. Read your Bible and do what he did. He's our example now. I'm going to share about the one who is the light of this festival. This festival of lights. This festival came about through the winds of persecution. And is remembered for the ones who were dedicated to the Lord. Now some things you, you might hear today. Some of you might have heard before. Some of you haven't. You might deem them controversial. It may confront you a little bit. Welcome to Beth Yeshua. No change there then. It's what we try and do. Because confrontation brings about change, doesn't it? So let's jump straight in and look at the book of Luke. Let's be controversial from the start. I'm telling you Luke was bare minimum a proselyte to Judaism. He was not a Gentile in that regard, as the church will teach you. With no real authority, by the way. He was with Shaul in the temple. Do you think he could get in the temple if he wasn't Jewish? It says in Romans 3 that the oracles of God, which includes the Berit Hadashah, the New Testament, contrary to whatever the Hebrew roots mob will tell you. They are the oracles of God, are they not? Who wrote Romans? Who wrote Luke? Who wrote Acts? Paul got authority? Luke got authority? Are they, are they the oracles of God? They were entrusted to the Jewish people, so says Paul. Anyway, you can chew that one over for a bit. And let's go to Luke. In the days of Herod, king of Yehuda, there was a Kohen named Zechariah who belonged to Avia, to the Avia division. His wife was a descendant of Aharon. Her name was Elisheva Elizabeth. One time when Zechariah was fulfilling his duties as Kohen during his division's period of service before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom among the Kohanim, to enter the temple and burn incense. How many times have y'all read that? You read Luke a lot, yeah? And it just goes, whew, just passes you by, doesn't it? And it's huge. History in the days of Herod. When did he die? 4 BC. When was Yeshua born then? Oh, the year zero? Maybe not. Zachariah was a Kohen. Oh, but Annie, that's no big deal. He was just a priest. So what? Really? No, 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 no. It is a big deal. He was a Kohen. What's a Kohen? A Kohen is an Aaronic priest. Different. High priest. Don't just wash over it. He wasn't a Levite. The Levites did all the grunt work and all the cleaning up when they did the sacrifices. 
That was their job. Nicole Hain was the ones who went and burnt the incense and did the sacrifices for the perpetual sacrifice. Different. Specific duties in and around the holy place and the holy of holies. So the ironic line and the Levitical line are different. Fair? And it says, Zachariah belonged to the Avia division, or Abajar if you read another version. Why, why, why would they put that in? Why would God put that in? Is it relevant? I've got an apologetic study Bible at home. And this is what it says. It actually says this, quote, this is what we're up against. The Semitic flavor of this passage and its inclusion of theologically irrelevant details has led many to conclude this passage was reworked by Luke from earlier sources. So it's, re it's not relevant according to them. And every, every word's relevant. You think God wastes his time? His wife, Elizabeth, Elisheva, she was a descendant of Aharon too. Maybe it is significant. Maybe it does mean something. Both of them from the Aaronic line then. That's got some meat in it, doesn't it? Do you think? Maybe, just maybe. When their boy, John, grew up and called out Caiaphas for being illegitimate and called him a viper from a brood of vipers, there was a reason behind it. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. I'm just throwing this out there for you. Maybe John should have been the high priest. Caiaphas was appointed by Romans. The priesthood was corrupted. So Zachariah is there performing his duties according to some kind of custom. Chosen by a lot. Was this custom a tradition of man, do you think? Did it come from God? Is it important? Should we just gloss over it? And not worry. So much meat in just a couple of sentences, isn't there? <laughs> it is absolutely important and we can't gloss over it. Where then would we find the tours of duty of the Kohanim? Stop it! Jump in the gun. I'm taking a point off you for that. <laughs> it is indeed in Chronicles, and you will see it's not the traditions of man. Going to do a bit of reading today. The, divi the divisions of the descendants of Aaron were as follows The sons of Aaron were Nadab, Avihu. Eliezer and Ithamar, but Nadab and Abihu died before the father and had no children. Therefore, Eliezer and Ithamar functioned as the Kohanim. David, together with Zadok from the descendants of Eliezer and Achimelech from the descendants of Ithamar, arranged them in divisions for service. There were more men who were chiefs found among the descendants of Eliezer than among the descendants of Ithamar. Therefore, there were 16 divisions of the descendants of Eliezer headed by the clan leaders and eight of the de descendants of Ithamar according to the clan. So 24 divisions, does that make sense? They were assigned periods of service by lot, one group equally with the other, since both the descendants of Eliezer and the descendants of Ithamar had officers of the sanctuary and officers of God. Shemaiah, the son of Nathaniel, the secretary, one of the Levim, 
recorded them in the presence of the king, the officers, Zadok, the Kohen, Achimelech, the son of Eviatar, and the clan leaders of the Kohanim of the Levine, two clan divisions from Eliezer, one of each, Ithamar, the first lot drawn. Now, it goes through the lots of service then. So let's just let's just backtrack a little bit. What happened to Nadab and Abihu? Strange fire. What does that mean? That means they brought a tradition of man before the Lord and <laughs> got blew up for it. Do you think they did that with the right heart and the best intention? Maybe their intentions were right. Maybe their hearts were in the right place. But so was Uzzah's when he straightened the ark. So were the people who worshipped the golden calf. They thought they were doing the right thing too. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. So what about the Samaritans? You remember Yeshua at the well? You you don't know who you're worshipping, lady. They had their own priesthood. They had their own mountain. They had their own sacrificial system. They thought they were doing the right thing too. It's not about your heart. It's about the word of God in your heart. And whether you obey it or not. What about Ananias and Sapphira? Think they had a bad heart? Part of the community? Must have been born again now. You have, you've got to think they had a certain extent of righteousness about them. So they get assigned services by a lot, 24 divisions in total. Many, many men in each division, meaning that they might only serve one time in their life as an Aaronic priest. 24 lots or divisions, each service, each service in Shabbat to Shabbat. And they were there to burn incense before the Lord. That's part of the duties. And if you turn over to 1 Chronicles verses nine, 10 to 19, you can see the 8th division went to who? Avia. With me so far, everybody? Not going to throw anything at me yet? Oh, you will. So we've just read the narrative of Luke telling us that this was Zechariah's division and he was on duty. What does that give us then? Gives us a timeline, right? There's time for everything. God's got a timing. His timing will at some point intersect with his promises and when it does we get what's known as destiny. Yeshua will return at an exact time. That's carved in stone and there's nothing you can do to bring that forward. Nothing. The feasts, exact. Everything he does, exact. All timing. Can't do anything right at the wrong time. And we called to no timing. Yeshua knew timing, didn't he? He went to be quiet and he went to turn the tables over, didn't he? Timing. So we know we've got 24 priestly tours. Therefore, we can work out when Zechariah was on duty. Can't we? Using Luke's narrative. 
And therefore we can find out when John the Baptist, or was he an Episcopalian? Who knows? But we can find out when he was born. And if we can find out when he was conceived and born, then we can find out something very similar for Yeshua. So he's fulfilling his duties as Kohen during his division's period of service before God. He was chosen by lot according to the custom to enter the temple, burn incense, and then appeared to him an angel of Adonai. Standing to the right of the incense altar, Zechariah was startled and terrified at the sight. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elisheba, will bear a son, and you are to name him Yochanan. When his period of his temple service was over, he returned home. Following this, Elisheba, his wife, conceived, and she remained five months in seclusion. Now, so when's the start of the biblical year? Hmm? No. Biblical. That's spiritual. Aviv, Nisan. Which is our March, April. So the priestly duties started at the beginning of the year. Adonai spoke to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, you are to begin your calendar with this month, Nisan. It's going to be the first month of the year for you. Fair? Biblical. Yeah? Not interested in tradition. Not the biblical. Yeah? I'm seeing your Bible. So, Nisan, our March, April, starts the priestly duties at the beginning of the year. So, Avia is the eighth division. So, that'd be eight weeks in. We go Shabbat to Shabbat, right? That fair? So Zachariah is on duty two months into the calendar. They burn incense. They also perform the morning and evening sacrifice. Why? Because they had to keep a manifest presence of God in the Holy of Holies. That's why. Sin. Sin's airborne. So you've got to sacrifice to keep the sin at bay. Yeah? The perpetual sacrifice. And he sees an angel, not a little cherub, a little baby with wings on. Probably huge, poof, macho, big. Startled him, terrified him. But he says, no, no, don't be frightened. Your wife's going to conceive. And it says, when his temple service is over, at the end of the eighth week then, Fair? He returns home and it says, following this, Elisheba conceived straight away. If you look it up, it's straight away. Pretty much right after he's come home. Sometime shortly after the eighth week. Fair dude? Does that make sense? It's not unreasonable, is it? Following this, Elisheba, his wife, conceived and she remained secluded for five months. You can see, just go back one, Beth. Sivan, see? Eight weeks in. Sivan. Now, When you're dealing with the Bible, you're dealing with the lunar calendar, right? You're not dealing with the solar calendar, are you? And we're saying it's our March, April, whatever. That's because it can it can vary a couple of weeks. Like 
Hanukkah can be in November, can it? Because that's up to God. Because it's the lunar calendar and he keeps us on our toes. Um, but Sivan, we're in Sivan. Elisheba is going to conceive in the month of Sivan. And we've got no reason to believe that there was um, anything wrong with the pregnancy. It's just a normal pregnancy, right? 40 weeks, fair dues. It's inappropriate to assume anything else. So we assume a 40 week pregnancy. That being said, can you just knock me? Oh. Where are we? Go back, go back to the calendar, uh, the, the month. That's it. So if it on a 40 week month, where's he gonna, he's gonna end up here? Back in Nissan. 40 weeks down the line from Sivan, yeah? John's gonna be born, if he's conceived in Sivan, 40 weeks down from that, he's gonna be born in Nissan. Is everybody happy with that? Give you time. You're, you're an accountant. You're not getting it? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Forty weeks. Yeah. Forty weeks. Ten times four is forty weeks. You're an accountant. Come on. <laughs> yeah, but you, you don't get a pregnancy for 52 weeks, do you? No? <laughs> Trust me, it's Nissan, okay? Whatever. <laughs> that I told you. Right? <laughs> Luna, yeah. So she's going. She he's going to be born in Nissan. Would that be fair? Right. Now, he's done his service. It might took him. It took him a couple of days to get home. She might have conceived within a couple of weeks of Sivan. Fair. I'm thinking, maybe John might have been born around Passover time. Maybe. Definitely Nissan. John was the one called to herald the Passover lamb, wasn't he? Redemption, deliverance is coming to you all. And it says Elishi was five months in seclusion, remember? Right? Luke 124, and then the passage carries on, and it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city in the Galil called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Miriam. She had a Jewish name, because she was Jewish. Approaching her, the angel said, Shalom, favoured lady, I'd annoy you with you. She was deeply troubled by his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Miriam, for you've found favour with God. Look, you will become pregnant. You will give birth to a son. You are to name him. You sure? How can this be? asked Miriam of the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, The Ruach HaKodesh will come over you. The power of Ha Elyon, the Most High, will cover you. Therefore, the holy child born to you will be called the Son of God. You have a relative, Elisheva, who is an old woman, and everyone says she's barren. But she's conceived a son and is six months pregnant. Without delay, straight away, Miriam set out and hurried to the town in the hill country of Judah where Zechariah lived, entered the house and greeted Elisheva. When Elisheva heard Miriam's greeting, the baby in her womb stirred. Elisheva was filled with the Ruach HaKodesh and she spoke up in a loud voice. Get this, 
How blessed are you among women, and how blessed is the child in your womb, Miriam. So she's already pregnant, and she's six months behind. Is that fair dues? So, if John's born in Nissan, and Yeshua's six months behind, when's Yeshua born? Tishrei, September, October. Don't miss it. Six months behind. Gabriel visits Miriam in Nazareth, shoot town. Isaiah, remember? You don't want to vacuum all the Jewishness out of it. Because we are, we are dealing with biblical Christian anti-Semitism in a lot of ways. We have to be a beacon against that. I will be a beacon against that. Because we've got to bridge the gap and speak against it. We're speaking against Christian anti-Semitism. We're speaking against replacement theology. In all its guises. And she conceives. Miriam and Elisheva. Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. Elizabeth was barren. But now she's pregnant. Nobody knew because she'd been in seclusion. Now she's six months pregnant. It tells you. Mary goes without delay. Elizabeth knows, and she says, your, your baby, he's special, because she knows. We don't miss that, neither. Did you, did, you, did you catch that? Elizabeth was filled with the Ruach HaKodesh. How did that happen? I thought it didn't come to lax. Maybe God was always around. Hmm? How blessed is the child in your womb. Six months behind Elisheva. And, Yeshua, and so Yeshua was born in Tishrei. Ah, September, October time. I'm sorry, not December 25th. So what's in Tishrei? There's a feast. Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Let, let me throw this one at your intray to see if you can file it. Why do you suppose John, Yeshua's favorite disciple, the one he loved the most, wrote, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. Maybe Johnny Boy knew something. Hmm? Just a shot in the dark. But Annie, you're messing me up now because Christmas is Christmas and it's what we've always done. I know. But Jesus is the reason for the season, isn't he? No, he's not. But that's what it means to me. That doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. What does it mean to him? Can can you show me how you get to December twenty fifth? Biblically. I've just shown you biblically how I get to Tishrei. September. Show me how you get to December. No? Show me how we get to Sunday. A Shabbat. Show me that. Chapter verse? Anybody? What about Easter? Biblical? No? Any biblical evidence? Any? Any? I'm, I'm open. I'm open to it. I'll hold my hands up. No? What about A.T. Robinson? How many of the Gospels? Mr. Baptist poster boy. 
a scholar. Wrote the harmony of the Gospels. Page 267. He wrote, there's no way he sure could have been born in December. No way. So we know it's not right, but we do it anyway. Is that because our hearts are in the right place? Maybe so. So was Nadab and Abihu's. So we're playing with a man-made tradition. And the truth of it is it's born out of total paganism. And we're shoehorning Yeshua into it. Because the church said it's okay. And they likewise said Sunday worship's okay. Well, they actually said if you're going to do it, we're going to kill you. Whatever. But they baptised it as holy. No? Proved that last week, didn't we, Sunday? This is something you've got to mull over, you've got to consider, and you've got to work out in your own head between you and the Lord. You've got to figure it out. You've got to figure out who you serve and why and what you will inevitably have to sit down and explain to him. Because I've told you before, I've done it before. Here's how it's going to be. Here's one. That's you. That's Yeshua. And he's going to say, what did you do? Not, not what did you think. Not where did you go. What church did you go? What did you do? And why did you do it? Judgment seat of Messiah. We've all got to go through that. You've got to explain yourself. You've got to give an account. What are you going to tell him? Well, it's not what it meant to me. Do what you will, but... Do it biblically and do it with an informed decision. What do we know about Sukkot? Deuteronomy 16:16, 16, 16, it's part of Shegos Regalim. Three times a year, Jewish boys over 20 had to go to Jerusalem. Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot, very messianic. Very messianic, no? Passover, the God who was, relieves you of the penalty of sin, doesn't he? Shavuot, the God who is, gives you power over sin, takes the fear away, should do. Evil's got no power. We're the good of fearless, right? Sin's got no power over us if we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Be who you're called to be. Shaviot. Tabernacles, the God who is to come. When he comes, guess what goes? The presence of sin out the door. Very messianic, aren't they? Very Yeshua. Very important. Around this time, Emperor Augustus issued an order for a census to be taken throughout the empire. The registration, the first of its kind, took place when Quirinius was governing in Syria. Everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. So Joseph, because he was descendant of David, went up to the town of Nazareth in the Galil to the town of David called Biet Lechem, the house of bread. Biet, house, Lechem, bread, yeah? Who'd be born in the house of bread? 
in Judah to be registered with Miriam, who was engaged and who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her first child, her son. She wrapped him in cloth, laid him down in a feeding trough because there was no space for them in the living quarters. Maybe because three times a year, all your men are to appear in the presence of Adonai, your God. The festival of Matzah, the festival of Shaviot, the festival of Sukkot. He's gone back to Bethlehem. It's five miles outside Jerusalem. What happens when there's a big event on? Everybody gets booked up, right? So that may be why there's no room at the inn for him. Because there's a lot of pilgrims in town because it's Sukkot. And maybe the Romans used that for the census. Just spitballing that one for you. No room at the inn, anyone? What about Luke 2 8? In the countryside nearby were some shepherds spending the night in the fields guarding the flocks. You, you wouldn't be able to do that in December in Israel. It's very, very cold. Very cold. Very cruel to keep sheep out. It's freezing. Hmm? Hmm? Cold though. Northern Hemisphere. Dead of winter. Okay. So where do we get December 25th from? <laughs> Let me enlighten you. We get it from Pope Julius the First In 385 AD, Roman Catholic Pope declared an edict to celebrate Yeshua's birthday on that day. Why that day? Because it's a Roman celebration to the god of the harvest saturn saturnalia the feast typically characterized by get this social disorder and immorality massive orgies drunkenness and the like just your run of the mill pagan holiday it didn't really change much did it Saturnalia, it goes back to 217 BC. You can look all this stuff up. It's out there. It's at, the f it's at your fingertips. There's no real excuse for it. You can be a Wikipedia expert in 10 minutes these days. It's just a date. Just a date. Well, what if you look into the tree? What if you look into the Yule log? What about the mistletoe? What about the holly? It's going to blow your socks off where you realise what it's about. I'm just saying look into it. Be informed. I'm not trying to undermine the church or granny or anything. I'm just here to tell you what's biblical. I don't want you to go home and set fire to granny's Christmas tree. but you do have to operate in truth and in grace and be loving. You've got to underwrite everything in love now. You don't have to chop down the tree. Somebody already did it. It's dead at the root, isn't it? And it's all about love. It's about walking out your faith in love, not attacking your family. Let them see you walking out your faith and what you believe. And at some point, they will ask you. And then you've got to tell them the truth. And you've got to defend the hope that's in you, don't you? But you do it with respect and gentleness. And be who you're called to be when you're, when you're asked. 
If you don't do it that way, it'll be it's going to be a bad reflection on God. It's going to be a bad reflection on the kingdom. It'll be a bad reflection on Messianic Judaism. It will be a bad reflection on Beth Yeshua. You don't have to combat all the man-made stuff. We are called to embrace and celebrate the word of God, though. And his appointed times and his appointed festivals. To that end, Yeshua gave a parable. Matthew 13. Yeshua put them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. Then he went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads of grain, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where have the weeds come from? He answered, An enemy's done this. The servants asked him, Then do you want us to go and pull them up? But he said no, because if you pull up the weeds, you might, uproot so you might uproot some of the wheat at the same time. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time, I'll tell the reapers to collect the weeds first, and then tie them into bundles to be burned, but to gather the wheat into my barn. Do you want us to go and pull them up, Lord? Like, attack your family? No. So the message is God has called us to be seed towers, not weed whackers, right? You won't get to anybody if you're not sincere and the Holy Spirit's not moving. If it is, they'll listen. You don't have to run up to people and smack them around the head with a Bible. It's not going to work. It's not going to work when you set fire to the tree. And you're thinking, well, I'm going to turn over some tables. Don't turn over the tables. It's not the right time. How about you turn some tables over in your own tabernacle first? How about that? Take that four by two out of your eye. Hmm? Now, can we go? Can we go back to Bethania, uh, that calendar? Tishrei. She was born in Tishrei. What happens when you go back forty weeks? Where's that going to get you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What month are we in now? What we're celebrating now? Isn't that strange? There are others out there who will argue, no, no, you can work the numbers out and it comes out different, Arnie. And you can make it look like Yeshua was born at Passover. That's okay, they're entitled. But Yeshua being born on Sukkot, when, when's conception? Forty weeks back, right? Kishlev. Chanukah, the Feast of Dedication, also known as the Festival of Lights. Maybe, just little maybe, little Miriam was lighting a menorah. 
And Gabriel rocks up and says, you're a blessed woman, Miriam, as she's lighting a candle for Hanukkah. And she gets pregnant with Yeshua at the Festival of Lights. The light of the world conceived at the Festival of Lights makes a lot more sense. Can't do that if he's born in Passover. He is the light, isn't he? That's why we celebrate it. And we honour it for those who have gone before, who were dedicated to the word. That's what Hanukkah is all about. They kept the word alive. Constantine and all that man-made mumbo jumbo it's messed up the faith 45,000 denominations was never the plan there is one God there is one Messiah there is one faith there is one baptism there is one olive tree it's not an evergreen and you're either a natural branch or you're a wild shoot grafted in but it's the olive tree the seed of which is Abraham, the trunk of which is Isaac, the branches are Jacob and the tribes. That tree is very unique. It needs the sun's light, S-O-N. The light of the world. It gets pollinated by the winds of the Holy Spirit. It's very drought resistant and it's very, very sturdy. And God always brings resurrection through it. Christmas tree is very pretty. It's full of silver and gold. Lights and a star. But it has been cut off at the root and it's dying just like the church. That seeker friendly, motivational, happy, clappy, happy meal, fill in the blank and colour this in kind of nonsense we've got to get back to where we were when the faith was at its most potent we need to be for a time like this because it's coming undiluted unpolluted back to where we started Jew and Gentile one in Messiah before the church split One in the olive tree, that's Messianic Judaism. That's where we're at. Then came Hanukkah, dedication. In Jerusalem, it was winter. Yeshua was walking around inside the temple in Shlomo's colonnade. John, the universal gospel. Section of scriptures, incredibly powerful. This is where he's saying, I'm the good shepherd. I'm going to lay down my life for you. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one the scriptures speak about. I'm the gate. I'm bringing in the Gentiles too. Why would God bother tell us about, tell, why would he bother to tell us about this? It's not one of the Levitical feasts. But Yeshua made the effort and went all the way down from the Galilee to Jerusalem to be there on Hanukkah in the depth of winter. Why? First Maccabees. As the days of Matthias were drawing to a close, he said to his sons, arrogance and outrage are now in the ascendant. It's a period of turmoil and bitter hatred. This is the time, my children, for you to have a burning zeal for the law and to give your lives for the covenant of our ancestors. Remember the deeds performed by our ancestors, each in his, in his generation. You'll win great honor and everlasting renown. Wasn't that Abraham tested and found faithful? 
Was that not considered as justifying him? Joseph, in the time of his distress, maintained the law. And so became the Lord of Egypt. Phineas, our father, in return for his burning zeal, received the covenant of everlasting priesthood. Joshua, for carrying out his task, became judge over Israel. Caleb, for his testimony before the assembled people, received an inheritance in the land. David, for his generous heart, inherited the throne of an everlasting kingdom. Elijah, for his consuming fervor for the law, was caught up to heaven itself. Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, who's that? Hmm? And we don't say those names because they are quite evil Babylonian God's names. God gave them names. They, were, they had the fidelity and saved from the flame. Daniel, for his singleness of heart, was rescued from the lion's jaw. Know then that generation after generation, no one who hopes in him will be overcome. Bury that in your heart. Bury it because you're going to need it. Do not fear the threats of the sinner. All hopes in him will be overcome. I'm oh, sorry. Do not, Do not fear the threats of the sinner. All his brave show must come to the dunghill and the worms. Exalted today, tomorrow he's nowhere to be found. For his return to the dust he came from, any scheming is to be brought to nothing. My children, be resolute and courageous for the law, for it will bring you glory. Powerful now. This is 167 BC, totally persecuted. He could be talking to us now, though. Couldn't he? Eliezer. Eliezer the priest. For his part, just before he died under the blows, gave a sign and said, The Lord, whose knowledge is holy, sees clearly that though I might have escaped death, and he could have done if he'd have succumbed, and assimilated but he didn't I could have escaped death from awe of him the Lord his God gladly endure those agonies of body under the lash that in my soul I'm glad to suffer that's how he died leaving his death as an example of nobility and a record of virtue not only for the young but for the greater part of the nation That's how to go out in it. It's for the awe of Almighty God, He gladly endures. It's dedication. It's hard to hear, I know. But that's what this is about. And you can't ignore or go past Hannah and her sons. Also happened, these seven brothers were arrested for the, with the mother. The king tried to force them to taste some pork. Important? Is it important? It's important enough for them to die for. By torturing them with whips and scourges, one of them, acting as spokesman for the others, said, "Why are you trying to find out? What are you trying to find out from us? We're prepared to die rather than break the law." of our ancestors, the king Antiochus in a fury ordered pans and cauldrons to be heated over a fire. As soon as these were red hot, he commanded that the spokesman should have his tongue cut out, his head scalped and his extremities cut off. And the other brothers and his mother looked on. They're prepared to die horribly for not eating pork, and what's the best we can do as a church? Woohoo! Baby back ribs! Come on! Re 
Really? When he'd been rendered completely helpless, the king gave orders for him to be brought, still breathing, to the fire and fried alive in a pan. As the smoke from the pan drifted about, his mother and the rest encouraged one another to die nobly. With such words as these, the Lord God is watching and certainly feels sorry for us. And as Moses declared in his song, which clearly states he will take pity on his servants. When the first had left the world in this way, they brought the second to be tortured after stripping the skin from his head. Can you imagine how, how evil and painful that would be? They asked him, will you eat some pork before your body is tortured limb by limb? Replying in his ancestral tongue, Hebrew, he said no. So he too was put to the torture in turn. They're encouraging one another to die nobly. They know they're going to go. They've got no way out. But the Lord's watching. Certainly feels sorry for us. She's not screaming, Where are you, God? Get us out of this, God. If Jesus puts me through anything like he's not my saviour, I've heard that said. Freaking out. Freaking out now, how are we going to be when it really hits the fan? And Hannah doesn't know you sure. They believe in the resurrection now. No questioning God though, is there? With his last breath, he, he, he exclaimed, Cruel brute, you may discharge us from this present life, but the king of the world will raise us up since we die for his laws to live again forever. After him, they tortured the third, who on being asked for his tongue, promptly thrust it out and held out his hands as well, courageously saying, Heaven gave me these limbs for the sake of his laws. I have no concern for them. For him, I hope to... From him, I hope to receive them again. The king and his attendants were astounded at the young man's courage and his utter indifference to suffering. When this one was dead, they subjected the fourth to the same torture. When he neared his end, he cried, ours is the better choice, to meet death at man's hands, yet relying on God's promise that we shall be raised up by him. Whereas for you, there can be no resurrection to new life. Next, he brought forward the fifth, began torturing him, but he looked at the king and said, you have power over human beings, mortal as you are. You can act as you please, but don't think that our race has been deserted by God. Wait, and you'll see in your turn how mighty his power will torment you and your descendants after him. They let out the six and his dying words were these. Don't delude yourself. We're suffering like this for our own fault. Having sinned against our own God. Hence appalling things have befallen us. We deserve it. Not going to hear that in too many places, are you? But what's it about? Evil's got no power. Where well, they've got to have no fear. Do not think you yourself will go unpunished for attempting to make war on God. 
The mother was especially admirable and worthy of honorable remembrance. She watched the death of seven sons in the course of a single day and bravely endured it because of her hopes in the Lord. Indeed, she encouraged each of them in Hebrew. Filled with noble conviction, she reinforced a womanly argument with manly courage. Saying to them, I don't know how you appeared in my room. It wasn't I who endowed you with breath and life. I had not the shaping of your every part. Anna giving glory to God. Hence the creator of the world who made everyone and ordained the origin of all things will in his mercy give you back breath and life since for the sake of his laws you have no concern for yourself. Antiochus thought he was being ridiculed suspecting insult in the tone of a voice and as the youngest was still alive he appealed to him not with mere words but with promises on oath to make him both rich and happy if he'd abandoned the traditions of his ancestors. He'd make him his friend and trust him with public office. The young man took no notice at all. So the king then appealed to his mother, urging her to advise the youth to save his life. After a great deal of urging on his part, she agreed to try persuasion of her son. He's sensing insult in her tone. She wasn't insulting him. She was just giving glory to God. And that's the whole point of this. You've got to embrace what's right, not attack what is wrong. And you've got to be courageous. The evil one sees the youngest is appealing to him. Because now he's thinking, this isn't working. I'm starting to look a bit stupid here. Because they're not giving in. So he appeals with promises. Daniel prophesied the enemy would change the times and the seasons. And he did. Change the calendar. Change the ways of God. And he'll use smooth talk to do it. Tell you what you want to hear. Tickle your ears some. And the believers will become like little babies because the world will be that watered down. It'll be like them drinking milk. And now they can't handle the meat no more. And they get angry with anybody who stands up on the truth. They call them arrogant. Maybe they're not arrogant. Maybe they just love the word of God. Maybe they just do want to. They just want to do what he says. How about that? But now he's leaning into the boy, appealing to him. He's embarrassed. He's looking bad. He's looking weak. Looking like he's losing his power. I'll make you rich. I'll give you status, fame, anything. Just do what he's told. And he says no. And then he appeals to Hannah. Come on, lady. He's your he's he's little boy. Come on. Do something. Bending over him, she fooled the cruel tyrant with these words, uttered in Hebrew, her ancestral tongue. My son, have pity on me. I carried you nine months in my womb, suckled you for three years fed you and reared you to the age you are now provided for you I implore you my child look at the earth and the sky and everything in them and consider how God made them out of what did not exist that human beings come into this being the same way do not fear this executioner prove yourself worthy of your brothers and accept death so that I may receive you back with them in the day of mercy Powerful. She's 
She'd hardly finished when the young man said, What are you all waiting for? I will not comply with the king's ordinance. I will obey the ordinance of the law given to our ancestors through Moses. As for you, you've contrived every kind of evil against the Hebrews. You will certainly not escape the hands of God. We're suffering for our own sins. And if to punish and, disip and discipline us, our living Lord is briefly angry with us, he will be reconciled with us in due course. But you, unholy wretch, and wickedest of villains, what cause have you for pride, nourishing vain hopes, raising your hand against his servants? You've not escaped the judgment of God. The Almighty, the All-Seeing. Our brothers have endured brief pain. Brief pain. For the sake of ever-flowing life, have died for the covenant of God, while you, by God's judgment, will have to pay the penalty of your arrogance. I, too, like my brothers, surrender my body and my life for the laws of my ancestors, begging God quickly to take pity on our nation. And by trials and afflictions, to bring you to confess that he alone is God. So then my brothers and myself, there may be an end to the wrath of the Almighty. Rightly let loose on our whole nation. He's putting himself in front of others. To take pity on our nation. Take pity on the nation, Lord. That's like they ever have to now. It's what Yeshua taught. Think of others greater than yourself. You'll never get depressed if you focus outward, by the way. Hannah was the last to fall. The king fell into a rage and treated this one more cruelly than the others. For he himself was smarting from the young man's scorn. So the last, mother, the last brother met his end undefiled and with perfect trust in the Lord. And then the mother was last to die after her sons. So why did Yeshua show up for Hanukkah? That's why. For Hannah and her boys. And all those who fought and died for the word because they died for him. He is the word. And we all owe him a debt because we would not have Yeshua without him. Would we? They could have been turned over. They could have assimilated into paganism. Hellenistic paganism. They wouldn't have been the first nation, would they, to fall? No Jesus. No Jesus, no Christianity. Simple as that. Understand, if you're not biologically Jewish, if you are born again, according to Romans 11, and you are grafted into the olive tree, you're supposed to honour him too. Hanukkah is about the messianic hope. It's not just a Jewish thing. It was a time of great suffering. It was also a time of great spiritual revival. And it has to encourage us to maintain our hope, our faith, even as trial and tribulation will come at us. If the Jewish people had to come to tyranny, there would be no Hanukkah because there would be no Israel. Jeremiah 31, this is what Adonai says. Who gives the sun as light for the day, who ordain the laws for the moon and the stars to provide light for the night, who stirs up the sea until its waves roar 
Adonites of old is his name. If these laws leave my presence, says Adonai, then the offspring of Israel will stop being a nation in my presence forever. This is about God making a new covenant. The Jewish people will always be here. It's a promise. It's got nothing to do with their righteousness or the lack thereof. It's got everything to do with the God of Israel promising. No Israel, no Jews, no Judah. Genesis 49.10 The scepter will not pass from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his legs until he comes to whom? Obedience belongs Shiloh, Messiah. It is to he whom the people will obey. No Judah, no kings. Samuel talking to David, I took you from the sheep yards, from following the sheep to make you chief over my people, over Israel. When your days come to an end and you sleep with your ancestors, I will establish one of your descendants to succeed you, one of your own flesh and blood. I will set up his rulership. He will build a house for my name and I will establish his royal throne forever. Thus your house and your kingdom will be made secure forever before you. Your throne will be set up forever. The Davidic kingdom. The kings come from Judah. We have an everlasting kingdom now. Yeshua is the king. The Orthodox, you just don't recognize that yet. Well, he's still the king of Israel. But they will. Just like b Joseph's brothers recognized him. So if there's no kings, there's no king of the Jews, right? Matthew, Magi came from the east. They came to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the newborn king of the who's? Of the Jews. So there'd be no Israel, no Judah, no king of, Ju no king of the Jews if they were all assimilated. And if the king doesn't show up, we're all done, aren't we? Because there's no deliverance. No deliverer. Praise be Adonai, the king of Israel, because he's visited and made a ransom to liberate his people by raising up for us a mighty deliverer who is the descendant of his servant David, Yeshua the king. But no deliverer, no Christmas. The angel said to him, don't be afraid because I'm here announcing good news. And it will bring great joy to all the people this very day in the town of David. There was, a, there was born for you a deliverer who is the Messiah. Amen. So what happened to bring about Hanukkah was crucial to the faith. And it was crucial to Yeshua, wasn't it? So no Hanukkah, no Christmas. Because Messiah wouldn't have been born, would he? We don't know exactly when. We do know it was a humble affair. Why do you suppose that was? His birthday was never celebrated by the early church. You won't see it anywhere. Not in Acts. Acts went over 35 years. There's no big to do about his birthday. His birthday is not the important part. His death absolutely is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Shaul says, I've delivered to you 
what is of first importance. Namely, that Yeshua died. He was buried and he was rose again. Of first importance. We're not saved by his birth, we're saved by his death. His resurrection is our blessed hope. We know the 14th of Nisan's Passover. We know the 15th of Nisan is buried on unleavened bread. And we know the 16th of Nisan, he rises on first fruits. We need to concentrate more on his word and on his feasts rather than trying to baptize him into something he was never in in the first place. Good intentions are now. We can't baptize man made tradition and put it before God and His Word. So, in conclusion, if you know Hanukkah, you will know Christmas. Hanukkah is about dedication, being purposed, committed, devoted, zealous, loyal. Surrendered and wholehearted. And if we follow the ultimate dedicated one, Yeshua, when we do, he will light us up. He'll light, he'll put, he'll light up our tabernacle. He'll light our menorah. So I'm praying that God grants us all purposed, Devoted commitment. I pray he grants us all zealous and wholehearted dedication by his grace and his mercy that we at Beth Yeshua will be a congregation of dedication. Let's all be Chanukhs, eh? Amen. Shabbat Shalom.